We are staff attorney at ACLU of Vermont. I don't know if you want to take a testimony or just go right to questions. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to get some remarks to share with us, sure. Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, you know, I think we put out, uh, you know, our position fairly clearly last week. I'm not going to retread um, that ground. I know the committee is interested in knowing areas in which um, various stakeholders have agreement and, and what are the remaining areas of disagreement. And I think I can speak for the Attorney General's office, but obviously I welcome correction uh, when I say that we, we broadly agree that the Department of Justice threaten, threatening to withhold these, these funds um, for failure to comply with certain new conditions is unlawful. That 8 U.S.C. 1373, which pur purports to prohibit states from putting restrictions on information sharing about immigration status with ICE, I think we agree that that's unconstitutional. And I think we agree that Vermont law, law enforcement works better and Vermont is safer for all when law enforcement is not entangled with federal immigration enforcement. Those sort of broad stroke, uh, more you know, values big picture statements I think we, we do agree on. Where we disagree is what that means in practice and what we can and cannot do as a state. Um, our position, as I, as I stated last time, is that we shouldn't be cowed by these, these unlawful threats under 1373 or these other conditions. Um, other municipalities and states have taken, taken strong stands and, and they've been proven successful in court after court after court. Um, but we would request of the, of the committee to the extent any changes to Act 54 or new legislation is proposed, is that we would ask that the section that refers specifically to 1373 and says that uh, any language in a local agency's policy that conflicts with 1373 um, is, is abolished, we would request that that language be removed altogether. Um, we, we think the state does better when it has a coherent and consistent policy that 1373 is unconstitutional and we are not bound in any way by it. Um, I think putting, you know, the, the language actually in the, in the act as it currently exists is, is yet more interesting because it says to the extent that a local policy conflicts with any lawful requirement of 1373. And our position is there are no lawful requirements. So the language is superfluous, but it's also dangerous because it lends credence to a statute that we believe is wholly unconstitutional. And it suggests that we're acquiescing in the dictates of an unconstitutional law. We also would like to make clear, as I, as I said last time, that the model policy sets a floor of protections and that municipalities are free to add additional protections on that foundation. Um, and it may be time to adopt some of the essential protections of the model policy into statute rather than in the policy. Um, you know, we, we have this biannual review process, and then there's the process of, uh, you know, fighting that out, and, and, you know, it requires consultation between the council and stakeholders, but it doesn't require listening to those stakeholders. And as, as we said last time, I, they listen, but they don't, um, there's no requirement that we come to some sort of agreement. And as we said last time, we vigorously opposed, migrant justice vigorously opposed, other stakeholders vigorously opposed the changes but ultimately they were adopted um, over our objections. And so we believe it's time for some of the more fundamental protections to go into statute where they will be, uh, where any changes will be the result of, of every party bringing their best arguments to the table and having the legislature decide what's best for them all. So thank you for your testimony. I'm wondering if in your suggestions about um, either thing, either putting it in statute or putting sort of tougher language by amending um, this bill, um, 74, I'm forgetting. Uh, Act 54. Act 54, I know, okay. So um, what is, like, what are the teeth? Like, so if it's, you're not in compliance, what happens? And is there, like, is it worth having something happen, so it's not, yep, yeah, we're not following the law, and that's that. Yes, <laughs> in a word, in a word. Um, 
uh, dictates of, of this variety must have some sort of enforcement mechanism, right. whether, you know, we could talk about any number of things, whether it's um, ability to bring a private right of action for violation of the policy or, um, you know, the, the enforcement mechanism to date has, has been lacking. Um, and I think this is part of, you know, where there was some frustrated, frustration about the amount of time it took for the Vermont State Police policy to be updated. Um, and, and I think we see there the real problems with not having an enforcement mechanism. Um, you, you know, whether it's putting specific timelines in here that if you don't adopt the policy by X date, this is your policy. I know there's some disagreement amongst um, our offices as to whether there's a triggering deadline by which the model policy becomes the state policy, so that could be made more clear as well. And is there anything like you will be put in receivership or something that might be like, well, we don't want that, but you know what I mean? Like something that would... Yeah, I make mean, people pause a little bit more about you know here's what we don't tolerate as a state. It's something that's regularly used uh, as an enforcement mechanism by the federal government entering into consent decrees with with law enforcement agencies or other you know public entities okay. that uh, have a pattern of of failing to abide by constitutional rights or laws or policies, and that's certainly something that. Um, you know, although the current administration has drawn back on a lot of those, prior administrations have, have made substantial progress in various police departments um, through the mechanism of a consent decree. It's overseen by a judge. So, thanks uh, for your testimony again. Um, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm in support of strength, you know, through statute. Um, and my understanding from listening to the testimony um, you know, last week is, is that if there was a state statute that, let's say, a fellow member group, you know, such as, you know, let's say, the ACLU, um, working towards getting some of our bad actors to act more appropriately, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that, um, because I think for the majority, at least what I hear, is, is that most people feel fairly strongly about supporting the rights of our residents in the state. But we have some bad actors, and I think that if it was in statute, that we supported the premise, then people would have a way of responding to those bad actors. Am I correct? Yes, so there, there's existing in statute uh, pursuant to legislation from last year or the year before involving um, law enforcement officer certification. Mm -hmm. um, Failing to abide by the fair and impartial policing policy can be a ground for losing your certification. I believe it's only on a second offense or something like that. So that that could be made made stronger there. Um, so 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 for example, you know, I I turn somebody into ice. That's my first offense. <laughs> no no, I, I I know I'm doing that with a little you know, right. joke, but no. Um, so th th that doesn't seem appropriate. You know, I mean, you don't get a first or a second chance. You know, you're supposed to do the job. You know, that's your job. Right, and and you know, whether or not the, the first incident results in decertification, there are lots of steps short of decertification that can be made. Additional training requirements. You know, going through your disciplinary process, whatever the case may be. Um, <laughs> but the, but the other issue is you, you sense the lack of tolerance. I, I, I noticed the face. <laughs> yes. Um, the other issue is, is under the current fair and impartial policing policy, turning someone over, over to ICE is not a it, you know, it, it says that we can't restrict you sharing information with, with ICE. Um, that's the 1373 prohibition that we've written into, into our, our statute and policy. Hmm. Thank you. So 
I have a question for you. So um, in, in the last hearing that we had, you well, it, it seems like a lot of this highlights and focuses on 1373. And in the last hearing, you made mention of other states that are responding more strongly um, to standing against 1373. I think Nevada was one of them that you mentioned. And I was wondering if you could go into any sort of detail about what sort of ramifications that had for that state and how they went about it and what they actually did, or any state. To the best I've been able to determine, uh, the DOJ hasn't gone after Nevada. Um, they've sent out letters to dozens and dozens of jurisdictions saying you're out of compliance with 1373 and we're withholding your funding. And I haven't been able to find that Nevada was one of them. Um, so I'm not sure why that is. But I think also um, we've, we spent a lot of time talking about 1373, but I think it's worth really focusing on the fact that no one was talking about 1373 two, three, four years ago. It wasn't being enforced. It wasn't, it wasn't an issue long before the Trump administration tried to convert 1373 into a weapon in its war on immigrants. Law enforcement still vigorously resisted any restrictions on their ability to turn over information to ICE. So I think 1373 is a convenient boogeyman right now. Um, but really, the question is, you know, why have we for so long resisted stopping our state and local officials from being part of the deportation machine? You know, 1373 is, is today's reason, reason du jour because of the way the Trump administration is using it. Um, but it's been struck down time after time after time. I'm confident that it will continue to, to do so. But the um, underlying issues that were there even before 1373 was being used in this way um, remain. Thank you. So uh, kind of related to that, can you give us some of examples of just the ways that 1373 has been upheld as unconstitutional? There are many. Um, the, the opinions on this matter are very, very long, and they sort of tick off. It's unconstitutional for this reason. It's unlawful for that reason. The, the sort of on its face, 1373 tells states what policies they can and cannot act enact, and the Tenth Amendment forbids exactly that. Um, so the, that's the constitutional question. But here, in the context of these specific federal funds, the Attorney General and the DOJ have no authority to attach conditions that Congress didn't see fit to attach to those funding streams. And so they also, under what's called the Administrative Procedures Act, the actions of, of um, the administration have been deemed arbitrary and capricious because there was an, an ultra virus. It's outside of the authority of the Attorney General to attach conditions because it's not just the 1373 condition. There's an access to people in custody condition and there's a notice, a 48 hour notice um, of release from custody condition. And all three of those have been across the board uh, wiped out in all of these cases. No, I'm good. I'm just taking a quick note of that. Yeah. So, isn't there a Second Amendment case that hasn't has upheld 1373 that would bind? I mean, it's the circuit that. Second circuit. Second circuit. Second circuit. Mm -hmm. Second Amendment. Second Amendment. <laughs> that's not where my mind is. That's not where my mind is. The Second Circuit or Federal Circuit. Isn't there a case? There is a 1999 case uh, in which the Second, Cir Second Circuit upheld uh, 1373, and it did so on the basis of a purported distinction between laws that require states to pass certain legislation or take certain affirmative acts and laws that prohibit taking certain acts or enacting certain legislation. Um, and the court held that 1373 is just a prohibition. You can't pass a law that restricts this information sharing. That distinction no longer is valid uh, based on recent Supreme Court precedent, which obviously is, is higher than the Second Circuit. And in fact, the Southern District of New York, in ruling against 1373 and these other conditions, held that, um, and, and other courts around the country that have looked at it, held that this subsequent Supreme Court precedent um, eviscerates the rationale for that Second Circuit case such that it's no longer binding on the lower courts. So, okay, so so actually, 
that the opinion in the Southern District of New York, is that, well, first of all, is that being appealed? It's still in the district. There's There were sort of questions about 2017 allocations and then forward-looking 2018 allocations. So it's still being fought out in the district. It will eventually be appealed, I would, I would imagine. So but the, so the district court essentially said that second circuit opinion is no longer good law because of the Supreme Court decision. Right. And other, and other courts looking at this have said the same. But how might that be binding if there was a challenge in Vermont? District court. I mean, the Southern District of New York, of course, is in the Second Circuit as well. So it's the Second Circuit right. opinion would have been binding on it if it was still good law. But this, the lower courts are permitted to look at intervening Supreme Court precedent that undermines what would otherwise be binding circuit precedent and say, you know, this this can no longer stand in light of the Supreme Court's subsequent opinion on the matter. Because I, 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 and you know very well where the, the problem is, is that legislators, uh, attorney general, have all taken uh, the oath to uphold the Constitution. We can't ignore federal law just because we disagree with it. We have to have a strong enough hook that says that isn't the law anymore. And I don't know if that's what I'm hearing you say is that we have a strong enough hook that we are not obligated anymore to the person saying that that's. Yes, certainly the District Court of Vermont would be bound by the United States Supreme Court precedent that um, that says this sort of you know, uh, prohibition type regulation is just as unconstitutional as the require affirmative requirement legislation. And you know that and that's the position in, um, in the within the Third Circuit, the City of Philadelphia um, has prevailed in in uh, they have a policy that puts, it says you can't disclose immigration status um, subject to three exceptions uh, when required by law. And it, it, I need to pause on that for just a second because 1373 never requires any information be shared, right? It's just a prohibition on limiting the voluntary sharing of information. So that one, that exception is not implicated here. Um, when the individual, him or herself, requests in writing that the information be provided, and then there's an exception for certain um, criminal activity. And, and that policy was brought up um, in this 1373 litigation and uh, the court held, yep, you, you're fine with that. 1373 is unconstitutional and can't require you to change this policy. The, the policy at issue in the New York litigation, likewise, placed significant restrictions on when immigration status and other information could be shared. Um, and, and you know, the city of New York, knowing what 1373 was, adopted and maintained this policy just as Philadelphia did, just as all these other jurisdictions have. Coach, uh, So, if take, taking uh, a Representative Earl Long's uh, point to the next uh, level, if we were to look at strengthening um, our rules from our existing uh, language, if in their research, Ledge Council's research on our behalf, uh, were to agree with you know your supposition, it would seem to make sense that we would have a point to stand on as a committee if we uh, certainly can be for discussion. Right. business and then that individual steps aside and he or she makes a phone call on a personal cell phone or has gotten off duty and I just can't recall how that was answered because I thought that I heard careful language around on duty and that piece. Yeah, you, you likely can't remember it because I didn't have a very clear answer at the time. <laughs> um, uh, you know, if, if information is designated confidential by law, uh, an employee who gets that information through the course of his or her employment can't take off the employment hat and then just disclose it, right? So, the, so for example, at the DMV, they have social security numbers for most of the people who come in. 
but if a person gains access to that social security number at work, they can't then leave and sell those social security numbers to identity thieves or whomever, right? And so um, uh, the, the state or locality as, as employer has um, a property interest in the confidential information that comes into their, into their possession and um, uh, just by sort of walking out the door, that property interest doesn't disappear. Okay. And, and to your knowledge, how have there been some wrangling, has there been wrangling around that? We know what the policy is, and we know with 1373, but yet things happen, and I'm wondering if, if there have been allegations that things are happening through some channel other than what policy says they should. I haven't heard of this off-duty, on-duty distinction being relevant because it's happening on duty. Quick question. Could, could you email, uh, I guess you can email to me, I can pass it on the citation for the Southern District of New York yes. opinion, the Second Circuit opinion, and the Supreme Court opinion that we were just talking about? Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Will Lambeck with Micah Justice. Thanks for having me back. Um, Are you okay with the, with the sun? Oh, that's fine, yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll also uh, try to be real brief in, in my testimony, uh, in part because we we agree with uh, uh, what Leah said, and in part uh, we definitely want to leave time for question and answers. But um, last week you heard testimony from uh, Micah Justice members about the impact of the uh, current lack of compliance and insufficiencies and in the fair and impartial policing policy. Policy. Um, and I, I just want to underscore that that the, these are, are widespread. Um, these aren't just one-off cases. Uh, in fact, we, we just learned uh, this week from a public records request that the uh, Addison County Sheriff's Department, uh, in an incident last summer, or excuse me, two summers ago, uh, had uh, at the Addison County Farm and Field Days they had rounded up a, a group of five farm workers because they had received a complaint of uh, criminal activity by a Mexican male, and they photocopied all of their identifications and forwarded uh, them, uh, emailed them to, to ICE. Um, we had known of the incident at the time, but didn't know that their documentation had been forwarded to ICE. We, we just learned that. Um, and and the, those sorts of things, I would say, are, are widespread and incredibly damaging. Uh, in terms of people's faith and trust in, in law enforcement and the real impacts of people being detained and deported and separated from their families and their means of making a living. Um, so uh, I, I know that uh, at least some of you may have been forwarded uh, uh, a 2015 study that was done uh, at UVM about uh, uh, migrants in Vermont and their, their opinions on, on police. and. And need, needless to say, we, we don't think that that study uh, sufficiently represents uh, the, the actual widespread and, and deep-seated fear that does exist. Um, one, it was done in 2015 uh, prior to the current presidential administration and associated policies, and, and we have a number of issues with the methodology, and I'm happy to talk more about those later. But based on my conversations with many of you, I, I think there's a general understanding that the current state of affairs uh, is not what needs to be and, and that we need to be doing better. So I'll transition on to that. Um, regarding uh, the insufficiencies in the current policy, um, 1373, of course, is, is a large issue. Uh, but I think if, if you listen carefully to the testimony uh, last week, you would have heard that the current policy that was passed in December of 2017 uh, represented what law enforcement felt to be uh, the compromises that they could make on 1373 and also what they refer to broadly as public safety concerns. So there are a number of loopholes in the model FIP uh, that have nothing to do with 1373, but that nevertheless are, are really damaging uh, because they provide uh, uh, carve-outs in the policy that allow uh, discrimination and collaboration to continue. Uh, however, on 
on the subject of 1373, um, second everything that uh, Leah said and that the ACLU has represented. Uh, but in addition, we would say that um, this body has already taken similar steps in the passage of S-79 in 2017. S-79, which was passed uh, overwhelmingly by, by both chambers, um, uh, restricts uh, sharing of information uh, between uh, state agencies and immigration enforcement. Um, and I'll, I'll just read the, the section. It says, a public agency shall not knowingly disclose personally identifying information to any federal agency or official for the purpose of registration of an individual based on his or her personally identifying information. Elsewhere in the statute, personally identifying information is defined to include immigration status. Uh, so this law says, when it's about establishing a registry, and it, I'm talking about a Muslim registry was, was the, the threat at the time, uh, public agencies shall not share immigration status. It's very clear in S-79. Uh, and so the state has already taken this, uh, this action, saying that when it's for this specific purpose, we can draw a clear firewall and prevent the sharing of immigration status with federal agencies. So we see this not as a legal question, but as a political one. Uh, if this determination has been made when it's for the purpose of the establishment of a registry, which of course we support that restriction and, and would vigorously oppose the state, uh, the state collaborating in the establishment of a registry, uh, why not extend the same protections to people uh, when it's to prevent law enforcement from being complicit in a policy of mass deportation, uh, the negative effects of which we're all very familiar. Um, so again, we see this as a political decision, not a legal one. Uh, this action has been taken by the state in the past. It's just about uh, where we draw the line. Uh, and, and we think there's very compelling reasons for Vermont to say that law enforcement should not be turning people over to ICE or Border Patrol, but that undermines their public safety mission. Um, so I think I'll end there, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, take questions, and, and there's plenty more I could say, but I'll I don't know how much Migrant Justice has contact with other chapters of Migrant Justice around the country and where things are going well. And sure. what, what seems to be making the difference there? Yeah. Um, so there are a number of, of jurisdictions around the country that have policy that exceeds Vermont's current state model policy. Um, I, I would note when I say that that uh, I believe that the city of Winooski has the strongest policy anywhere in the country um, because they've taken uh, uh, what's afforded to them under Act 54, which is to implement at a minimum each component of the model policy. And so they've treated that model policy as the floor but not the ceiling, and they've strengthened it considerably. Uh, and we think Winooski Police Department's policy is the gold standard. Um, but around the country, there are certainly other policies that exceed um, the state model policy. So Leah spoke about a couple. I would note uh, San Francisco's policy as well. Uh, and this is a, a policy that is the subject of, of litigation in the Northern District of California. Um, and in their policy, um, uh, this is quoting from the um, from the, the federal district court's decision. Uh, they say that San Francisco's policy uh, expressly prohibits any city or county funds or resources from being used to assist federal immigration officers. Um, so this is the, the sort of language that we think creates a real firewall, a clear distinction, without any carve-outs, without any loopholes, just saying it's not your job don't spend your time and resources on this. Uh, and in reviewing the policy, this federal judge said, in agreement with every court that has looked at these issues, I find that Section 1373 is unconstitutional. They upheld the policy, it's a policy that's working, um, and, and I see no reason why Vermont can't do the same. So, 
I'm wondering, I feel like it would be helpful um, to this discussion and looking at the, you know, the version of the fair and impartial policing policy that's um, posted online and publicly available, but I'm wondering if um, there were very specific proposals of a language. I know there was a dis part of what we're talking about is a dispute in the crafting of this policy. Um, so I think it would be helpful for me, at least, and maybe for other committee members, if there if there was very specific proposed language that was not adopted, if we could kind of see that language and um, be able to kind of look at it in the context of how it. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for the, the question, Representative. Um, and uh, there are uh, four major points of disagreement that we have with the current model policy. Um, and on each of those, uh, we believe that, that Winooski Police Department's policy uh, corrects those failings uh, and implements stronger language. So we, we would submit Winooski Police Department's policy uh, as the, the corrective. Um, there, there are also policies from other jurisdictions, and, and Leah has shared a number of those, Nevada and elsewhere, uh, that, that we could look to as well. Um, uh, but also recognize that here in Vermont, over the past year, there's been a police department implementing without any hitches, without any problems to public safety, uh, the, uh, a version of the policy that, that we would like to see adopted statewide. Um, so I I'm, uh, only have a few copies, but, but uh, it's online as well. Um, Briefly, some of the areas where Winooski improves upon the state model policy is um, it prohibits information sharing without the nebulous carve-outs uh, that are included in the current state model policy. Uh, it uh, restricts officers from uh, using uh, illegal entry as a pretext for investigating immigration status. Uh, in other words, under the state model policy, an officer could discriminate uh, and approach a, uh, an immigrant and ask about their status and then say, oh, I wasn't investigating immigration status. I was trying to ascertain whether they had recently crossed the border. Uh, Winooski's clamps down on that by saying that uh, officers shouldn't be investigating uh, that issue. Um, another uh, difference between the state model policy and Winooski's is that the state model policy uh, allows uh, uh, ICE access to people in detention, um, and, and this is what happened in, in the case, uh, we believe, of Olman Lopez, where uh, ICE showed up to the state police barracks and were granted access to, to this person in state police custody. Um, uh, Winooski's policy doesn't allow for that. I, I won't go through all of them, but those are the sort of things. So as Leah said, um, we think it, it's time for some language to, to be put into statute um, to, to make it crystal clear that this is the law uh, in Vermont, that policies have to uphold uh, these standards. Uh, and the, the most important one is, is ensuring that uh, uh, immigrants' confidentiality is, is protected by restricting information sharing between local, uh, municipal, state agencies, and federal immigration authorities. Uh, well, for the for the committee, I was wondering if you could touch on the the importance and the contributions that migrant communities bring to Vermont. Sure. Um, how, how much time do I got? <laughs> no, I mean, I could highlight it. Yeah, and and I I won't dwell on it too much because I I think I and mean, th those of you who I've talked with really understand this at a core level, um, and and in large part, and I can say you know frankly. Thanks to the work of migrant justice over the last decade, uh, our state has evolved significantly in its understanding of uh, the central role that immigrant communities play in the cultural, social, political, and economic life uh, of Vermont. Um, but as to the, the community that, that my organization uh, is, is formed by, of, of specifically uh, immigrant farm workers concentrated in the dairy sector, uh, I, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that uh, Vermont's dairy industry would, would not exist in its current form were it not for immigrant workers. Uh, if, if you go to any uh, uh, milk and parlor in the state, if, if they're hiring workers, those workers are going to be from Mexico or Central America uh, milking cows. Um, uh, and that, that's been the case for a number of years. 
Uh, and so if, uh, th this is in addition to being an issue of equal protection, uh, of human rights, of due process, this is an issue about uh, our rural working landscapes. Thank you. Chair, with the Attorney General's office, uh, thanks to the committee again for uh, holding this hearing and allowing us to testify. Uh, I'll cover briefly um, our office's outlook on this throughout the process of creating this policy and enforcing it, um, address some of the points that have been made, and then turn towards the forward-looking um, issues about what we can do to um, strengthen protections for immigrant communities. As we mentioned before, I really do believe that the goals of the advocates and uh, our office are, are the same. Um, the ACLU's testimony earlier today was correct that we really, there's, there's very little disagreement on the legal issues. Um, there are obviously some key points of disagreement. From the very beginning of this process, back in 2017, when we started negotiating, I believe in late August, over what the policy was going to be, uh, it's important to note that while our office does have a important sort of a special role in creating this, ultimately this is the policy of the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. And on that council, we have consistently been a voice for making this policy as protective as it possibly can be for uh, immigrant communities. We have come into this with the attitude that we need to protect, protect all Vermonters, protect all immigrant, protect our immigrant communities. Uh, and we have expended a lot of time and energy to make a policy that does that. Um, in terms of what Vermont is doing in comparison to other jurisdictions, I, I have not had a chance to look at the Nevada situation in particular, um, but it's our understanding, doing a review of these issues, that all the jurisdictions that are fighting this in court and that are taking on the Department of Justice are essentially doing the same thing that Vermont is doing. We're not behind other jurisdictions. What we're doing is saying is interpreting federal law as narrowly as the law can be interpreted, building the most protective possible um, policy, the most protective possible po policy we can around that interpretation. Um, and that's essentially what the other jurisdictions are doing also. If you look at, say, Washington State, which I did have a chance to look at, they issued an executive order in 2017, um, which did a similar thing, trying to be as protective as possible to their immigrant communities, but also noted, just as uh, Vermont has done, that nothing in the policy is intended to violate 1370, they named 1373 specifically. Um, with regard to a lot of litigation going on, almost all of the, I believe all of the jurisdictions are arguing two things. One, that their policy actually does comply with 1373, so they're not trying to baldly state that we're you know, this doesn't, um, we don't have to pay attention to this. They're saying we do pay attention to this, and it's also unconstitutional anyway. That's essentially the position that Vermont finds itself in. We have been judged by the Department of Justice already to uh, be in violation of 1373. Vermont is not receiving funding because of that determination. And our argument is, A, we are following the law, which is it is our obligation to do, and B, uh, it's unconstitutional anyway. Um, so we really feel that we are not being less protective than other states, uh, and we're in essentially the same posture towards the uh, federal government as other states that are trying this. There were a few, I think, older policies prior to the Trump administration taking office that have been floated around out there as um, examples of what could be followed. I think the reality is that those old policies that were passed when there is no real issue around this are not the ones that are people are fighting over. They're fighting over ones that have been created and defended more re under the shadow of the uh, current federal policy. Um, and I'd have to check the Northern District case specifically to make sure I'm right about that. 
again, Julio Thompson, the other uh, assistant attorney general you heard from last week, is the expert on that. But I believe, and I acknowledge I could be wrong, I have to check, I believe they had the same general argument. We're in compliance, and it's unconstitutional. And that, again, we're doing the same thing. We are not doing less than uh, the other states and jurisdictions that are fighting about this. I think with regard to um, the uh, policy going forward, we had a couple of suggestions. One is to make it explicit in the statute that, and when I say the statute, I mean Act 54, to make it explicit in Act 54 that the that Act 54 is a floor and you can be more protective. A local agency can be more protective than that if they choose to be, can be more protective of immigrant um, rights or be more protective of immigrant communities. I know uh, ACLU believes that that is currently uh, permissible. The issue is when you look at Act 54, there is no reference to being protective of anything. All it says is, um, you shall adopt at a minimum, or establish at a minimum, the components that are in the model policy. The term minimum has no value judgment in it. It, it just, it's a numerical statement that you could do more components than are, what in the, than what are in the model policy. If we were to judge, if our office was to say, without the support of the text of the law, that we interpret minimum to be, we're going to say that minimum means uh, you can do more components and they can, they can only be more protective of, the, uh, of immigrant communities. If there were some future attorney general who came in and said, well, they determined that minimum can just be other things that add to the policy without necessarily being the same components as the policy, they may then come in and say, well, we think that Agency X, who wants to adopt a policy that, or adopt a component that says, um, our officers shall share all information about immigration citizenship status with ICE. That's obviously against the spirit of our policy and not what we want to have happen. But there's no nothing in the text of the of Act 54 to prevent that type of um, interpretation from carrying the day because there's no value judgment in Act 54 about what the components have to be that are beyond the minimum. So our interpretation has always been the component, new components cannot conflict with whatever is in the policy, I should say, with the components that are in the model policy, because that is the way of ensuring that we are being protective and that somebody's not going to do something that we disagree with strongly on the policy. That being said, we fully support the legislature giving the direction and saying, all right, we are now are adding a value judgment to this statute, and that value judgment is uh, components that go beyond the minimum, they can be more protective, and they could conflict with current components as long as they're more um, protective of immigrant communities. I will say plainly with regard to the Winooski statute, um, oh, sorry, the Winooski policy, that policy is plainly in violation of both Act 54 and federal law. Uh, our office, given the open-ended leeway, has chosen not yet to say to Anuski, you must adopt the model policy. The reason is because we are coming to this with the attitude of trying to be as protective as possible, and we're hopeful that a change in the statute, um, the change in Act 54, will allow, would, would allow Anuski before we go in and say, all right, you're you know, you're done, we're going back to the model, and you can't do what you, what you were trying to do, that, we, that it does allow them a little more leeway. Uh, we, and so that's sort of been our attitude. Again, trying as best we can to be accommodating, to being protective of immigrant communities. So the language that you just spoke about, that do it with that? It would allow some of what Winooski has done. I think our reading of Winooski is that it also would you know, we're, we're still saying that we are obligated as a state to follow the law. We're obligated by this legislature additionally to follow the federal law. And so there isn't complete leeway for them to violate federal law or to, vi to change components such that it would be violent of a federal law. Um, but there are at least, I'd say, one and a half components 
where um, we think that there could be adjustments made that um, don't have anything to do with federal law. And uh, Will Landbeck from Migrant Justice was correct in saying that while well, most of the disputes, the final disputes that um, remained at the end of the negotiation process were about 1373 and where federal law lies and what our obligations are towards it, there were definitely one and arguably a part of another one that was not really tightly related to federal law. And I can go into that if you want, but for now I'll just leave it there. Uh, and that would be an example where a local agency could make a different decision about their public safety priorities than the council decided to make. Um, the other piece that we would say is um, making it explicitly clear that when a court of competent jurisdiction says that 1373 does not apply to Vermont, I should say if or when a court of competent jurisdiction says that 1373 and 1644 don't apply, for whatever reason that might be, um, that would sort of be an automatic, we don't have to wait for an act of the legislature, but at that time, um, agencies are free to move beyond um, the model policy to be, more, again, more protective and now uh, taking on stances that may previously have been violative of 1373. <laughs> Arguably, the current language could support that interpretation, but in order to avoid those arguments, and again, in order to make it clear to future occupants of government seats who may have a different outlook on these things, to make it clear that local agencies um, can do that without there being any ambiguity there. Um, trying to think if there's any other <coughs> big things. I think that was most of the points I wanted to get out, and I'm happy to take questions. I'm not sure I caught what the distinction you said about what kind of court, a court of competent jurisdiction? Yeah, it's a, it, sorry for the legalese there. It's a term that just means a court that has jurisdiction over our state in this case. Um, and just saying, so. It, that'd be the second That'd circuit. be the second circuit of the U.S. Supreme Court or the Vermont District Court. Right, but we also heard previously mention of Supreme Court of rulings that were felt to be um, having a different take and um, overruling what the Second Circuit did. So I didn't know when you used that language if you meant to somehow look at one direction versus another and if you want to add it. Yeah, so our belief is that there is, as far as Vermont is concerned, no court has overruled the prior law saying of 1373, so overruling 1373. All we have right now is precedent saying that it is constitutional. <coughs> it is true that there's a recent court case, and our office has taken the position that this recent court case um, means that 1373 is unconstitutional. But we don't have any rulings saying that. The Supreme Court case that we're talking about was not about 1373. It was about sports gambling. However, the implications of that ruling seem to indicate that 1373 is also unconstitutional. But we don't have a court that has said that, that has jurisdiction over Vermont, and it's, since it's our obligation to follow the law and follow the courts, we have to wait for that before that can take place. So, um, I mean, one way to get that ruling would be for the state to stand behind the policy of a policy that view 1373 is unconstitutional and argue it in the case of a, right? Well, I mean, yeah, I think a couple things here. One is that DOJ has already said that we're, I don't think we need to do more to have a reason to argue with the Department of Justice since they're already saying that we're out of compliance which we think is untrue. That gives us a hook. Um, so that is something that could probably happen. And I, you know, some of, when it comes to choosing to do lawsuits or not to do lawsuits, to be transparent with the committee, I'm somewhat, we provide legal advice to clients who are other state agencies, and I can't um, talk I can't talk about that without being in violation of our obligations as attorneys as to those discussions. Um, but that is a discussion that 
would happen between our office and the client agency because that's how the suit would come to pass and that's something that uh, will have to take place. So David, um, it sounds like your, I guess I want to understand, is your office saying we hope the legislature will take action or that if the legislature wants things to change, they're going to need to take action because the AG's office is not going to put a value judgment on the floor issue? It is our hope that the legislature does take action in order to allow us to okay. enact these policies the way they're hope we're hoping they, they can be enacted. And again, we don't feel we're free to yes. add a viewpoint where the right. law didn't have one. Okay. So is part of what you hope we do to address, again, I'm concerned about ramifications for law enforcement if they're not following policy. I don't know if there are other Vermont law, I mean, there must be Vermont laws that if a police officer does something, there's a consequence. So any sort of advice on like where are their consequences and what might they be because how serious we are about it may be reflective in if it's like oh you're not following it but we're not going to do anything about it so it really is up to the individual police chief to decide if it's important to them right i mean i think actually aclu had a, had a important point earlier, which is that our professional licensing is one of the really valuable ways that you can get at that problem, is to stake somebody's license on compliance with the policy. And that is already written into um, statute. I, I'm not going to remember the act number off the top of my head. I think it was passed in 17 also. Um, but looking at that again more carefully and saying, have we done enough to really connect these things tightly and making sure that that's a piece of the landscape to know that it isn't just a matter of your feeling like you should do it. It's a matter of your license being at stake. And again, we definitely were hearing at the hearing last week people being very careful to say not using resources. And I'm wondering if when we're clarifying if it's important for us to say, just like other occupations have, you can't take the information you have from your job and do it on your own time with your own resources. Because it does seem like there are professions that spell that out. Yeah, I think uh, what you're getting at is actually at the heart of some of the litigation, which is saying, the federal government can't direct how a state allocates its own resources. That's vi in violation of the Tenth Amendment. That's where we're getting towards this other, uh, that's where this other case that we keep referring to yeah. comes into play, where it's, it's said right. this law was saying that the state can't use its resources in a certain way, so it was... I, I'm getting into the weeds quickly. Yeah, but no, but, okay, was, no, that, your, your question is right at the heart of what these court cases are. And does it, though, is there anything that you can think of that would keep us from adding into it? Because, again, this wouldn't be state resource or federal resource. It's more knowledge, right? Because we're still not using anyone's resource. If Kimberly at night wants to call ICE up, but she's using knowledge she has as a legislator because she got to see a list of people's social security numbers who are undocumented. Like, and so maybe it's not just law enforcement, maybe it's also doctors or whatever. But like, it seems like we don't, thank you, we don't, I don't want people using information that they only have because of their position to, on their own time, and not at the states or federal, you know, 
share that information. Right, and you're, my, so, hopefully it's, uh, Assistant <laughs> Attorney General Thompson can come in and clarify, but my understanding is that the cases so far haven't hinged on the distinction that you're talking about. The My understanding of them is the access to the information itself wouldn't exist for these individuals if they weren't right. being paid by um, their, their local um, jurisdictions or states. And so the courts, as far as I understand, have not been basing their arguments on this sort of time on, time off type of difference. It's just saying, look, you have this because you're employed. Your employer gets to set the rules. And, you're, and the federal government coming in and trying to change that is not constitutional. So if this fine group of people here agree with me and we built it into amendments to act, the act, would that trouble you? What, what would you ask to build? That in? people cannot use information obtained as part of their job to turn in people? I think the specific language would really be important. Um, again, it's been our attitude that as long as the federal law is the law, we're obligated to follow, you know, we take an oath that requires us to follow that law. And so the language would be important. The very, and I, we'd really have to look at it and decide, because these things often come down to right. a very close analysis of the wording. Um, Again, if you look at the model policy, we have tried in various places to really tightly restrict communications where we feel it's lawful to do so, and we could try to use that as a model. But the, the resources piece, you're right that some of the language in other policies has been talking about resources, but I think that the court cases are hinging on how much the federal government can command the local agencies to do or not do. Right. And again, if there's corrections out there from the lawyers who've been more closely involved in it, I'm happy to have the committee hear that. But hopefully, uh, Julio Thompson can come in at some point, too, and really delve into that side of it. David, uh, quick question. From what I've heard from the law enforcement side of things is that one of the biggest concerns has to do with sex trafficking. And do you have advice on how we can move forward in a way that protects the migrant communities in our state while also allows while also allowing law enforcement to um, adequately go after the sex trafficking cases that have been right seen. yes so I think there's a couple things one is if you do look at the model policy it, it says we're not asking about immigration status or citizen status we're not asking about any of that uh, for victims and witnesses unless it does have to do with crimes where it's necessary to know that. So sex trafficking and human trafficking are the prime examples of that. So I think you can write out rules about that. Even if we're to imagine a world where 1373 doesn't exist or is ruled unconstitutional, um, my guess is that the vast majority of law enforcement agencies would still want to be able to tackle those problems. And to tackle them, they almost certainly will need to be able to access federal knowledge, yep. for lack of a better term. Um, so I, I think it's unlikely that many agencies would say, we're just not talking at all. But I think you can build in restrictions where you say, we're not talking except for these particular types of cases where it's probably necessary that we'll need to access information that the feds may have. Thanks. Last week, I know there's questions about Vermont State Police policy. Um, Excuse me, are you okay with this on there? Um, so we can just it's fine. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. I um, I just want to 
mention that I appreciate the efforts of this committee to try to get this right, and I appreciate the efforts of everyone who's provided testimony today and, early, and last week because I do think that this is a complicated matter and that um, we really do need to get it right. Um, I, other than people who are in Vermont, I can't think of any entity that has more to lose than police to not get this right because essentially what's at risk is the trust of the people that we take an oath to protect. So what makes me uncomfortable is when it's implied or flatly said that police are discriminating. Um, that is a very serious allegation, and I think that if, if there are cases where people feel that police are discriminating, they should take every step possible to make a, a formal complaint about that in whatever way that is, whether it's through a suit, a lawsuit, through an um, internal affairs complaint. Um, I am certain that the Commissioner of Public Safety, I mean, I'm speaking for one agency, but our Commissioner would take it very seriously if um, we have discriminated against anyone. So I, I want to say that first. Um, let's see. Um, just for context, um, I want to make it clear that State Police is one policing agency in Vermont. Um, we provide the primary policing services for 200 towns across 90% of the land mass of Vermont and serve 50% of the population. Um, we have 334 sworn members, 60 emergency dispatchers, and many civilian support staff across the state. Um, an example of sort of a typical year call for service, we had 59,736 calls for service in 2018. Um, calls for service include something like domestic assault related calls. In that one category, we had 1,000 calls for service. Um, we made approximately 65,086 motor vehicle stops in 2018. Um, in that time frame of 2018, I am aware of one case where um, we received a call for service um, of somebody leaving the scene of a crash. We followed, we, we were able to find that car and the operator of that car we had probable cause that that person was under the influence of alcohol. Um, we arrested that person, processed that person, brought them back to the barracks, um, and through that process, um, contacted a federal entity, I think it was Border Patrol or ICE, and that person was picked up um, by, that, by ICE. Um, I think that sometimes there are misunderstandings about what the law enforcement purpose would be for reaching out to a federal authority. Um, and I'm very uncomfortable with the supposition that it's always about um, something sinister. In fact, I don't think there should ever be a time where we contact federal authorities unless there is a law enforcement purpose. And that purpose has to do with um, identification or, authentic or authentication of a person's identity um, or their form of identification, I should say. Um, other than that, sort of collaborating or sharing information for no purpose is d directly hurts the public trust and hurts the public that we serve. Um, so, but, but having said that, there's, there needs to be clarification around the practical reasons why a law enforcement entity or a law enforcement officer would contact federal authorities. And I think that there's like a sweeping um, mischaracterization around why that would happen. Granted, there are instances and examples that were provided today that are disturbing on their face without looking deeper into them that everybody should be concerned about, but um, there are reasons why authorities, why, why law enforcement authorities communicate, um, and, and it has to do with um, public safety as a whole. Um, Having said that, just some background around the policy process itself. In 2003, state police enacted the first fair and impartial policing policy. I think of any policing agency, I can't say that for sure, but I believe that in 2003 we were the first. Um, in 2009, we revised our policy with assistance from um, the governor's legal counsel, now Justice Beth Robinson. We worked really hard on it. It's been revised three times since then. Um, Today, it was distributed to the field for its sixth revision since 2003 when it was enacted. 
um, in general, policies for police and policies for all organizations are a reflection of your values as an agency. So our policies have to be operational and easy to understand in the field, and they also reflect the values of your organization. Um, I can tell you that this is a policy that we um, take very seriously because it really does reflect our most core values. Um, and it's also something that we receive, uh, that we have to pay attention to because it has to be operational to the people who actually are in the field using this policy. And the, the portion around um, collaboration with federal authorities and what questions you can and cannot ask is, um, can be confusing to people in the field. I mean, look, we're talking about it here at length and for years and years. Imagine being in the field and trying to know what to do that's right um, and what isn't right. So please keep that in mind. And we've appreciated the assistance of the Attorney General's office to help um, cut through all of the different interests to help us create a policy that is the most um, operational. Um, I have a lot to say, but I'm going to try to pare it down. Um, just a reminder that Act 54 said that model policy needed to be modified to the extent necessary to be in compliance with these federal codes. We have no interest in enforcing civil or criminal immigration laws. However, we do have a big interest in being compliant with federal law. So if um, I can tell you that there is not a single case that I'm aware of where a victim or a witness of a crime has ever been asked in any unnecessary uh, way what their um, citizenship status is. Victims and witnesses of crimes are not asked those kinds of questions, um, nor is there communication with federal authorities about that unless it's in the context of assisting someone in getting a visa that could help them to be able to stay here. Um, another point I want to make um, is, let's see. Um, you know, we are also in a position, and this whole thing about money and the Department of Justice money being withheld, I feel like that's, um, it's a real thing for our department. Um, it impacts um, how we enforce drug-related um, crimes. But at the same time, I don't want it to be heard as like, well, they're going to lose money if they don't comply with unconstitutional laws. I care about our department's missions in all of these different areas, but not at the extent of our integrity or our values or what we care about. Um, having said that, I think it's important for this committee to know that at the same time that we are literally told that called, you know, publicly um, that we're discriminating against people, yet I don't see any allegations formally filed through our very accessible um, misconduct process. We are also um, contacted by the Department of Justice and asked, you know, your policy is, the reason why the money is being withheld in my most simplistic way of understanding it is that they are saying that we are not in compliance with 1373. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting that on one side we are accused of discrimination and doing bad things, and then the feds are saying we're not in compliance with 1373. So it's kind of crazy making, and also they have they had asked us in a letter most recently, it, in my summation of reading that letter, to make it a little clearer to the field that there's a much broader way that we could interpret 1373 if we wanted to, which was very uncomfortable for me to read. And our commissioner said, no way. Tell us where we're in violation of 1373 and, and leave it at that. So I feel like it's just interesting to be in that position where we are hearing it from all sides that we're wrong when what we want to do is the right thing by people in Vermont. And we're open to answering all these questions at any time. Um, so that is my, my speech. Um, in terms of the policy itself, I'm happy to answer questions. We were, um, you know, again, we had this model policy. It then sort of was outdated, and it was missing the mark in like four or five areas with, in comparison to the model policy. We have since worked with the Attorney General's office to get it in compliance. Um, it had to do with um, 
sort of um, when we could ask questions about someone's status. Um, interpreter services was, a, was another aspect. There were some minor tweaks to our victim and witness policy um, and some other areas that I can refer to specifically if you want. Um, that policy was published. It went through the whole formatting process that we have and approval process, and it is out in the field now. Um, you had said it's out in the field for revision as of today, and I don't... Not for revision. It's out in the field for adherence to the policy now. Oh, for adherence. Sorry, yeah. I thought I heard you say revision. Not for so revision, no. confused about that. Okay, so it's just adopted, fully it's, adopted it's and fully being adopted. implemented it's, as of today. It, right. It's distributed to the field, and then every member has to read it and sign it. Um, but having said that, it's it's in the field now. So I apologize if I have certainly added to any of the points that you raised because one, I know how hard you have been working to bring the state police forward on these issues. And in talking about law enforcement as a whole, I think we have to be careful about what we mean by that because again my you know I don't have any specific examples and I think you're right about people need to speak up I'm cons and I'm concerned about each town um, right cause you're, like so it's interesting because you all represent 50% of or provide services to 50% of the towns leaving the other 50% up to their own devices. And it also seems like whatever action, like the fact that it's out there and it's being revised again, like even hearing the comments from last week, people have been making movement on in your department. So, so I... Wait, what do you, I'm sorry, what do so you So it mean? sounds like, I know last week there was some comment made at the hearing about that the state police did not have their policy, and well, yeah. we didn't until yes, but today. So right, so that we're using the old policy. Yeah, um, so so I think we have to be careful to not have that single story about law enforcement. And I know when we use the term bad actors, I'm thinking more about confused intention. Like I don't even want to think about bad actors as much as confused or unclear intentions or bias that we need to assume sort of good intention and training first, rather than assuming that people are trying to have ill will, because again, yeah. So, so thank you, and I just feel like it's, it's important to see, and I was gonna go check on Burlington's, like is it front and center how to make a complaint if there's been a law enforcement issue, because it is on yeah, I mean, it's on, oh, I'm not sure with Burlington. Or, I would or other, the other, you know, towns, because I think that's going to be key mm -hmm. um, for people to come forward and not just mm -hmm. make complaints, because yeah. not everyone can go to, you know, the ACLU to right. represent them. And I and I should say too, there was one allegation. I mean, there are several allegations made against any member of our department in a year. Um, we average, I think maybe 50-ish cases that the commissioner opens for formal internal investigation. Don't necessarily quote me on that number because it could be a little less. Um, there were zero allegations of bias-based policing last year. There were two allegations in 2017 that um, were open for formal investigation. Um, the commissioner did not make findings of bias-based policing in those two instances in, in 2017. So. Um, just for context. And not all local departments of law enforcement handle things the way the state police do, I'm assuming, right? Like, like you can't speak for law enforcement as a occupation in Vermont, right? Like, you're not intimately familiar with what each... I can't really speak for each department. Um, I can speak generally about um, how complaints are handled, but not, you know, not specifically what type of how rigorous each department's process is. There's certainly right. ways in which anyone can make a complaint about a department and should. Do you have any, and I realize 
this is more asking your opinion, but do you have any thoughts about the number of police departments that haven't adopted a policy? I mean, I'm assuming most of them have different rationale than why the state police one wasn't. Any uh, depart the number of departments that have not adopted a fair and impartial policing policy, um, I would defer <coughs> to the attorney general on that. I don't. Yeah, I no, don't, I just didn't yeah, know. Yeah, I'm but sorry, I don't. Like, I don't see, I don't know, but I can't see where people wouldn't have just adopted the model policy if they didn't have a policy. It's right there for them. I just wondered, uh, being in the field, mm -hmm. if there's anything. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know of any anecdotal stories of departments that haven't adopted a policy. And your thoughts about my teeth question for if law enforcement isn't following this law as either if, as it gets amended or doesn't, like what teeth, like the, it sounds like two people have suggested the professional licensing for. Mm. Well, there's certification. Certification, through, right, right there's, yes. No, uh, we get, get our certification through the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, that is certain, that certainly has teeth to be decertified. De um, you know, obviously there have to be due process, and, but that certainly um, has teeth. But also, you know, in our department, you know, an allegation of misconduct, which discrimination or those types of things are, is a very serious, you know, allegation. So that should be used broadly if that's the case. And can you remind me how much federal money the state police stand to lose? Roughly, um, I want to say roughly two million dollars, but I don't. It's like two to five million, and okay. I should know this, but I don't. Okay, it. no, somebody it's, else might remember it. I mean, because I know that there are other. It's just over. Okay. So it's the same amount that Woodside is getting backfilled for losing their <laughs> Medicaid money right now. Which is interesting. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Major, so question so trailing off of the the money part of this the money that is currently being withheld by the federal government that was going to the state police's drug unit is that that's right? correct the drug task force yep. yes which is kind of a combined effort between state police and other uh, law enforcement entities yeah. and the drug task force they're still currently operational there's still detectives in there doing that, that work. is correct and where are they, where's that unit currently getting its money from? Um, I don't have the exact answer for that. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that we maybe are able to sort of borrow from somewhere else mm -hmm. while we await, like maybe borrow from somewhere else while we await that, right. um, while we await that decision about that money. Um, I, I should have brushed up on that before I came here, but um, I think we sort of been given permission to take it from somewhere else with the <coughs> expectation of it being um, reinstated. So don't quote me on that. But. Okay. And um, um, one one more quick question. So do we do, does the state police stand to lose federal money in any other areas? Any other task for, task forces? If we were, if this committee were to hypothetically take a stronger stance against 1373, um, I don't. I'm not aware of other areas where we have um, federal funding oh. being applied. Thank you. Right. Yes, I'm Victor Billy. Um, you know, as, as my fellow member said, you know, I uh, wasn't casting aspersions about. Uh, I have the utmost respect for the work that has been doing. Uh, that being said, uh, I think we're all about trying to make sure that that's a shared philosophy throughout law enforcement, not just the truth. Uh, and, you know, I, I think uh, our colleague uh, clarified that by his question to you in reference to uh, the effect that our chain might have, you know, on federal funding, uh, but it seems like it's it's not uh, 
it's not an inhibitor you know, in the work that you're doing at present? Well, I mean, I'm, I can't speak to the work of the drug task force. That is a big part of the mission of the state police. And I, our sense, because of that, is something that the state of Vermont wants us to be dedicated to. So I am not saying that that is not something we would let, uh, I'm not saying it's something we'd let go of without a lot of concerns. Um, I just want to say that I was using that as an example of, on one hand, we are being told that we're um, discriminatory for abiding by the law, which is 1373 and 1644. On the other hand, the federal authorities are saying that you're not abiding by the law because you're not taking a broader definition of what it means that you can collaborate about. And we're saying, pound sand, that's not how we're going to handle this. So, um, but I'm not meaning to be heard as saying the money isn't something that we need to do our jobs. No, I, I, that part I, I got, you know, I, it, and it, was, it was understood that you said that, you know, we've made accommodations at present. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we don't have to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully at some point, you know, they'll get their head screwed back on straight and uh, we might uh, be able to look at that, that support again. But getting back to the operational component, you know, as far as uh, what happens in the field mm -hmm. you know, to uh, our fellow Vermonters. Mm -hmm. Because as long as they're here, they're ours. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, anybody that we're responsible for. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough space right now. Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure what the, you know, the answer is. Mm -hmm. I think we'll just have to kind of work on it together. Testimony today is um, I'm really trying to understand when what is really going to get us to the point of accepting that this is unconstitutional. We're hearing that there's a number of cases that have ruled that, but we're and and in some ways it's a position of the state, but at the same time we're sort of so I, I feel like there's nuance there that maybe. Will could help us at least understand. Uh, on that issue, just real quickly, I, mean, I think Leah probably presented the best argument for that uh, today. Right. And, and I've, I've asked our legislative council on that to review that because you know, she will give us, she's our first yes. yes. And that I think even a, more so right. than Julio. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to hear from Julio as well, but, but I, I've already asked her. Yes, to, to that was very helpful. Yeah. 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 Yeah, just like there just seems to be this tent, this sort of agreement of like some agreement and then this sort of tension about mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking like, okay, so when, when, how do we, when do we have the point where we decide? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
it's not, not an easy Well, <laughs> I feel it's not an easy question. <laughs> yeah. no, okay. um, I'm, I'm feeling pretty strongly about the idea that we need to stand up more so for migrant rights and migrant workers as well. And, you know, this comes from my own belief that, you know, the, the police in this state are supposed to protect everybody in their community. And when you start picking and choosing different communities, it, it, start, it starts creating problems um, in, in the broader picture. And what I understand is that our, the Vermont State Police's Drug Task Force has already lost the federal money, and as Major Jonas indicated, it, it doesn't seem that there's any other federal money that is at risk of being lost. And despite that loss of money, the Drug Task Force is still operational. There's still detectives doing that work um, in our communities to combat the opioid crisis that we do have and is something that we have to address as well. But yeah, that's that's my feeling on that, is that we should stand up. Just sort of piggybacking on that, I, I also had to note here, thinking about that, what if we get maybe some from Department of Public Safety in, because one of the questions, if we are to do changes to this, will be our colleagues asking us, what are the consequences? And we need to be really clear if we're talking about dollar consequences, they look like this. And if we're talking about other things, that's that gets us into the realm of some of the things we're discussing today. But it would be good just to put to rest what that is so that we're able to ask, answer questions that might be asked about that. Actually, um, I'm just, <laughs> just walk that back in. Um, do you have any specific questions that you, um, that you didn't hear today that maybe Money that you yeah, can um, ask, and, they, and certainly if you don't know, you can get back to us. But sure. Mm. Um, you might address someone too. Is it? Is that is that Jonas? Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, I was just saying that we're talking about different consequences of making uh, modifications to Act 54, and one of them that I just want to have a handle on, if we do decide to go forward is what might be the consequences. And there are consequences that go all sorts of directions. And one of them is um, people will say, well, we might lose Department of Justice funding, or we might lose certain dollars. And I just want to be clear in financial terms what might be the consequences. We, we heard today it's about $2 million, And then we heard some follow-up Q&A about, well, money might be moved from one um, place to another. So just trying to get um, sort of clarity about what might be the financial burden and where it's felt. Uh, well, I can just, just clarify what I said earlier, which is that. So for the record, I think, yeah. I mean, you can mm -hmm. sit there, but just, just as a Okay. Yeah, so um, Vermont State Police or Department of Public Safety gets approximately two million dollars. No, I'm sorry. I'm just can you state your name. Oh, sorry, Andrew Jonas was the police, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, currently, and for a while now, receives two million dollars per year in federal funds to, for the drug task force, so the, the uh, anti-heroin mission of the department, um, and so that would be one of the things that would. Be a consequence likely, uh, but I, if I don't have all the details on that. I'd have to have get more information and get back to you about. But that's that's the currently the status right now. We're not receiving that money. We're not getting it from somewhere else permanently. We're simply told that we can borrow it in hopes that we'll be paid back paid by the DOJ later. But that is not a long-term plan or a replacement for the federal money that runs the drug task force. And is it those same federal monies? When I read in the local Times Argus that the city of Montpelier may have lost some funding, and I thought that it had to do with um, protective police equipment, or I can't remember, frankly, all the details. Is that municipal uh, impact factored in, or is the $2 million talking about what's being used only within the Vermont State Police so I don't know the other ways that federal funds are used around the state. I only know about the, the two million 
million and change that is used for our drug initiative, our anti-heroin and other drug uh, task force. So I really can't speak. I can't answer that. So I, um, one of my earlier uh, questions is resolved. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Lalong, for uh, uh, requesting Brim's uh, input. You know, on the where we're at with the uh, uh, the legal construct. You know that that aspect. Um, so so that eases a part of my uh, uh, questions. Um, uh, your question about the finances uh, helps that side. And I think to go one step further is past the uh, DSP funding, you know, is there another uh, uh, funding source that municipalities go to directly other than DSP. You know, I mean, is, is that our federal umbrella for uh, special initiatives, or does it come through some other avenue? Because, like, like you said, when, when and if we move forward with changes, to be able to have talking points as a committee to be able to help our other colleagues in the House and possibly even the Senate understand why we were we felt strongly about making you know the corrections and then this is the justification as to why and this these and these are the consequences as well. So you know, I but, see we have um, folks from the league, but I think could we turn to you to get that information or would it be more the chiefs of police? I think uh, Greg Zach of the LCT. Yeah. Um, I think I, I don't want to speak um, I'd say the wrong thing. I do understand that Burlington gets funding, and I, I don't know how the impact of uh, sheriff's departments get funding, perhaps. DMV, I don't know if there's there. I mean, there's other things to worry about other than DPS. Yeah. You have to speak directly to DPS if there's... But in terms of municipal... Uh, right, but I, 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 yeah. in terms of municipal, as I understand it, DPS doesn't okay. have any funding going to the town, though that would be great if they did, but, <laughs> um, um, but there might be something embedded that I don't know about. Um, and so I would say talk to the police chiefs and have them weigh in more yeah. discreetly because they know about the real nitty gritty stuff that they might not be aware of. Thank you. Um, so one thing that I'm wondering is should we also have a conversation with someone in Senator Leahy's office given that he's on appropriations and judiciary, like there may be ways that he might think of to have the state get money but have it go to ADAP and then, I mean, so I just wonder, it just seems worth us having a conversation um, with him. I also know that there's a lot of conversation about um, the sheriffs and the money that they collect that they currently keep in their own budget and if that ends up following rules related to how the rest of the state does it, that might be money. Um, we just, again, backfilled a bunch of federal money in the budget adjustment to Woodside to the judiciary and OCS for the audits. So we do do these things, and if it's important to us as a state, that could happen. And I'm wondering why don't we try to have a phone a phone conversation with someone in the Utah AG's office and find out how they've been. Was it Utah that has no, Nevada. 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 Oh, geez, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're going. I was. Everyone was looking at me weird with Utah. I was like, with the Nevada office because why not? Like we did that related to marijuana. And maybe we can hear what their thinking was in being able to do that. I don't know if it's worth talking to anyone in, in the states where the cities have done it, but why not try Nevada? Um, and it does seem important to move forward, sort of making our the intent clear. Like I. I just worry about 
sort of in two years be in the same place if we don't take some action? I think that's maybe David's language, right? David's language. David's language. David's language. David's language. Right. Okay. I wasn't sure what you're asking for feedback on if it was just on a particular yeah, no, is, Aspect. That, is, that Meaning, you, is that what you're referring to, what that we heard, or, um, no, or even broader? Broader, like broader, like what's important to us. I'm, I'm concerned about, I am definitely concerned about the distinction that will come of, of people doing it on their own time, and I'd rather, and again, maybe we could ask Nevada, like what were they, what was important to them? I haven't looked at their stuff, and why did they do that? I mean, it seems like that will be as valuable as getting input here from Bryn about what her take is on it, but let's just go to the places that did take the step. It will give comfort to our colleagues. 